Hello and welcome to part three of our lecture series here at Freedom Project Academy. Uh, the title of this one is History of Human Dissection, Superstition, Science, and the Soul. Uh, we've done a really, I think, comprehensive job in the last two sections, the first two sections, of considering the study of human dissection, the place for the scientific study of the anatomy of the human body, placing it in the context of philosophy, history, medicine, and culture broadly. We're going to do the exact same thing in part three, carrying through with our discussion of Renaissance anatomy and dissection. We pick up where we left off with our consideration of Andreas Vesalius of Brussels. You may recall that uh, this is the title page of his pioneering anatomical textbook, the De Fabrica Humanis Corporis, right? On the Fabric of the Human Body, published in 1543, an absolutely revolutionary medical text that foregrounded physician-led dissection. You may recall at the very center of the image there, you have the anatomist Vesalius looking out from uh, this picture at us, one of the only two figures in the entire image to look directly at the reader. He has his fingers in the dissected uh, abdomen of a female cadaver, and he is lecturing on the origin of creation. Where, did, where, do, where in the human body does uh, body and soul become one? That place where God infuses the soul into the body and you have life as we understand it. This is the origin of the universe. We also talked about how this image changed the course of dissection, anatomy, medical studies, physiology, surgery. Everything began to change with this. Uh, modern med medicine had been modernizing before this. Uh, certainly medieval physicians were allowed to do uh, a, a limited number of dissections of human bodies publicly, but this really began to change the ethos. Now for the first time, the men who had the anatomical knowledge based on the textbooks, the physicians, the highly trained physicians, were now the ones actually dissecting the body itself. Uh, what this image suggests to us uh, with Vesalius as, as this heroic figure um, excavating, if you will, from deep within the female body, the place where body and soul become one. This is as close as they had come, they believed, to uh, studying anatomy primarily to figure out where the soul was. The major purpose of anatomy uh, in this period was still, it wasn't medical knowledge, it wasn't simply basic an anatomical knowledge, it was to try to locate in the human body that place where the soul could be found, that part of the human body, the soul, that was made most in the image of God that would outlast the human body. When the human body returned to the dust from which it was made, uh, that soul would endure. That's what these philosophers, these philosophers who were first and foremost philosophers, not scientists, what they were looking for. And so in this image, Galen is trumpeting to the world that the universe may not be geocentric or even heliocentric. The center of the known universe may not be the earth or even the sun. Maybe the center of the universe is that place where the human body, uh, a, uh, an animal body trapped in nature, is infused with an immortal soul in the image of God. So maybe, just maybe, uh, the universe is euterocentric. It's womb-centered. That the center of all that makes us human, part animal and part angel, can be found right here in the body of this dissected criminal. Uh, so you have that powerful tr uh, trinity in this, the re-underscoring re re of Trinitarian understandings. You've got the, the anatomist, the body, and that memento mori skeleton, which reminded us uh, that death is something more than a physical process, that death is, should be a reminder to us in a memento mori way to consider the fate of the soul. So the dominating skeleton there that is bigger than any other figure in the image, it's the only other figure in the image besides the anatomist who excavates the dead body, who looks out at us and stares directly at the reader as a reminder that if you don't be like all these other obser observers to the dissection scene, all this throng of humanity who are pushing into the center of the image, trying to get a closer and closer view of what the doctor's doing, and all of them ignore the memento mori skeleton, whose lesson to us is, is that life is mortal, you will die, we are dust and shadows, that eventually all of this scientific knowledge serves to just bring us closer to our own death. And remember, in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, ate from the tree of knowledge, right? The Latin word, the ancient word for which would have been scientia, or science. And so you've got this conflicted message going on here that by all means, study the natural world. By all means, excavate the human body and consider uh, medical research and knowledge uh, as, as advanced as we can from an empirical perspective. However, 
never lose sight of the larger philosophical moral of all of this, that everything that human beings do on this earth is ultimately finite uh, and, so, and, and transient. So if we move to our second image, uh, our new stuff for today, the, one of the most absolutely re- amazing, remarkable aspects of the Fabrica, this, this revolutionary anatomical text, was its illustrations. We had mentioned to you in the previous section that uh, Vesalius did a remarkable thing. He teamed up with a world-class artist, somebody from the school of Titian, uh, the great, great, one of the great, four great Renaissance masters, uh, one of the most remarkable painters, users of image and color uh, the world has ever seen, Jan Stefan van Kalkar, uh, a student of Titian who worked in Titian's studio, uh, teamed up with, with uh, Vesalius to create images to go along with his texts. If you look at this wonderful image of a skeleton, um, we have seen memento mori skeletons. Uh, what's remarkable about this one is how anatomically, uh, generally speaking, correct it is. You have a really high quality drawing of an articulated human skeleton, a skeleton that has been, the flesh has been boiled, stripped off it, the bones, the sinews, the muscles have all been boiled away so that you have a skeleton that then the anatomist puts back together. This is called, in 16th century parlance, a put together skeleton like this was known as an anatomy. So anatomy was the discipline of piecing apart bodies to find out what they looked like, but an anatomy is also a fully reformed skeleton. And so you see this skeleton here, and you see the little marks around the bones, around the skull, around the arms, around the legs. Uh, This is one of the very first times in Western culture where you had images, where you had letters that were attached to images, the parts of the body, that then could be referenced by an index. I mean, this to us seems absolutely obvious that you, whenever you had a, an illustration of something scientifically, you mark it, you add numbers or letters to various parts, then the viewer can go and look at the letter and then find a corresponding letter in an index and be able to read about it. What is the name of that bone? Where is it located? All of this other stuff. But that was a relatively new technology in the 16th century. Uh, there had been some some botany textbooks from uh, a, a few generations before that had done that with images of plants and flowers. But this is really the first time it was applied in a meaningful way to the study of bodies. So what you have in this picture of the skeleton is a very technologically sophisticated drawing, rendering here. Uh, very scientific, empirical, research-oriented drawing. And yet, notice what you have. It's all graveyard poses. The skeleton, we don't pose, in modern medical laboratories, we don't pose skeletons like this. We don't, we sort of hang them from a chain and you can look at the body and you can identify the parts. But here you have that moral message, that memento mori, that philosophical remember man that you will die. Think beyond natural bodily things. We have these uh, scientifically advanced images of skeletons placed in very, very um, suggestive philosophical and spiritual poses. Here you have uh, a skeleton reflecting on its own mortality, a, a sort of a uh, anatomical Yorick, a hamlet in the graveyard studying the skull of Yorick. All right, you, it's obvious you're in a wasted, a, a desert area, a wasted graveyard. You have the monument there, a body's buried underneath that tomb, and you have the skeleton re- very reflectively, like Rodin's The Thinker almost, posing over mortality by studying the skull. And so it's that argument we've been making from the beginning, that from the time of the ancients, from the time of Aristotle, all the way through the, through the Renaissance, the primary purpose of anatomical study was spiritual, reflective, philosophical, and yet you also have this burgeoning, uh, empirical, research-based aspect of it as well. And written on the tomb there, you can see the Latin, right? And the translation of what is inscribed there is basically, all splendor is dissolved by death. And through the snow-white limbs steal Stygian hue to spoil the grace of form. Genius lives on, all else is mortal. Think about the image there. All human beauty, all divine bodily splendor. The idea of, you think about, at the very time these images were being made, Michelangelo was sculpting his um, David, that perfect physical body. Uh, Renaissance artists were uh, honing and refining their ability to paint and to sculpt and to represent the human body in plastic and paint forms. Uh, And it's really remarkable because so many of the great anatomists of the 16th century, they were all uh, artists, I flipped that around, so many of the great artists of the 16th century were all anatomists. We know that Michelangelo dissected bodies for about 30 years. Uh, he, we have uh, records where Michelangelo would barter with priests at the local church. Uh, the priests wanted some statues sculpted. Uh, 
for their church, and Michelangelo wanted to be paid not in money, but in bodies, corpses from the, 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 the hospitals, right? Send me the corpses that weren't claimed. And so Michelangelo would dissect human bodies in great detail and make anatomical sketches of them to, in order to help him paint bodies better or sculpt them. The muscles underneath the skin, how do the bones sit? How do the muscles flex when a body moves? To be able to strip the skin off a cadaver and look at the muscle, pose the body, really gave painters and sculptors a leg up. So many of the great artists of the 16th century by of necessity became anatomists. Most famously is Leonardo da Vinci. We know that Leonardo da Vinci left th thousands of anatomical drawings in his notebooks. Uh, very, very committed to dissection. Dissected bodies on very, very uh, elevated scales. And you think about somebody with the intellect of, of da Vinci, he actually drew anatomical structures inside of human bodies that we still uh, haven't really been able to photograph with the kind of precision that he drew. So in some modern medical textbooks, they will use illustrations of da Vinci's work after 500 years to give us a view of, of hard to access bodily places. And it gives you a sense of how anatomy, the humanistic study of the universe and the scientific, they went hand in hand. That's the great hallmark of the Renaissance in general, how humanistic learning, philosophy, theology, art, literature, how all of those subjects could work hand in glove with the emergent scientific and empirical research methods. So science and uh, the humanities were not enemies. They were not opposed to one another. They worked in very close lockstep together to bring both philosophical, spiritual, and medical naturalistic knowledge uh, to the people who uh, patronized these arts. And going back to the skeleton there, uh, the, the moral, the, what, what super supersedes all of this is that morality play, that etching, that, youth, that, that argument that's made on the tomb, that everything's splendid, all human beauty is ultimately dissolved by death, and through the perfect white limbs will eventually steal the poison that is death, and it spoils the grace of form. The only thing that lives on from a scientific perspective, the only thing that lives on from a human perspective is genius. Right? Genius artists who are able to create images like Michelangelo that we remember forever, or genius scientists, researchers, who, who contribute to our overall body of knowledge. Genius lives on. All else in this world is mortal and dies. That's why the recurring emphasis on trying to live your life conduct your research, paint your paintings in a way that glorified God and in a way that moved you uh, to an eternal realm after your time on this earth. And when we see moving forward, uh, the next set of images from the Fabrica, it really is remarkable. These are the images designed to the muscles. And so if you start from the right and work backwards to the left, you will see a fully formed uh, human body that has been stripped of its skin, it has been flayed, the skin has been peeled away, and you see really detailed drawing of the musculature of the human form, uh, remarkably sophisticated, artistically rendered incredibly beautifully. But if you move from right back to left, you see that body slowly being disaggregated uh, as the muscles, the uh, top layers of muscles begin to be stripped away to see how the muscles underneath work. And as you move from right to left, you see the body become uh, increasingly uh, picked apart, less human looking. And more deeply do we begin to understand on a smaller and smaller scale how all the parts and pieces of the body function. And if you start from the left to the right, and this is really a remarkable observation, I think, if you start from the left to the right, the way we read books, you begin to see how the body gets put together again. It's like one of those flip books, right? Where if you drew something on every page and you flip the pages, you get a little cartoon in motion. If you start from the left to the right, it's as if the human body is not being dissected. It's being reassembled. And that is a key for them, right? For them, dissecting the human body was a spiritually fraught thing to do in terms of destroying that which is made in the image of God. Here, by reversing the imagery, by starting with the most dissected and graduating to the uh, completed body, you are in a way reassembling, right? So the anatomist could claim that he dissected to reassemble. He tore apart the human frame to give us a better comprehensive understanding of its place in the universe. Really quite beautifully done. Um, and then, you know, the human, the mortal toll of all of this, if we look at our next image, uh, I call it articulating skeletons. We had said that to put, a, to put a skeleton together again, once it was pulled apart, is called an anatomy in the 16th century. In modern scientific terms, it's called an articulation. 
To put a, ske a skeleton together is to articulate it, to take the pieces and put them together as a whole again. Well, this, in 1545, a few years after the publication of the Fabrica, we know that Vesalius was given a corpse to dissect, and it was the corpse, the body of executed felon, infamous felon of Basel, Switzerland, man by the name of Jakob Kerrer von Gibweiler, uh, a famous criminal who was ultimately uh, uh, executed for his crimes. The body was turned over to Vesalius to dissect after the execution. And this now, and you can see the image there, we still have it from 1545. It is the oldest uh, anatomical preparation that survives in the world today. And so if you go to the University of Basel, you will be able to see in their medical section uh, the, ske the first skeleton, the first skeleton, the oldest skeleton we have that was prepared anatomically put back together. And you can get an image there and you can see uh, the gap between how uh, comprehensive our modern articulation process is from what theirs is. Uh, not a perfect job by any means, but uh, it's that moment we come in contact with the tangible human remains of an individual who had a story, a story that we know. Uh, we know about this man. We know about his life. We know about his crimes. We know about his death. And we now know, too, we have now, we still possess that skeleton, uh, that, that memento mori imagery, right? That uh, whatever scientific, whatever medical value this skeleton used to have, has had for 500 years, uh, however historically significant it is, is as the oldest anatomical preparation yet surviving. Uh, it, there is also that other side of the story. Uh, this was a human being. He had friends. He had uh, loved ones. He had children. He had a career. He had aspirations. And so you got that dual monetary significance of this, uh, trying to remind us about the ephemerality of all life and the transience of all human experience. Uh, we move from Vesalius and his absolutely pioneering treatise to people who then fought, who pushed back at him. Um, the Fabrica really triggered a chain of, of, of an ever ongoing chain of anatomical textbooks, anatomical research that sought to go even beyond what Vesalius had done. Like all great pioneering scientists, he laid, Vesalius did, a great groundwork uh, from which to begin scientific research. And the, the, the researchers that came after him of necessity superseded him often. And this is one of the most famous and one of the most interesting of these anatomists, a man by the name of Rialdo Colombo, right? His, his Latinized name would be Columbus. Uh, the same as Christopher Columbus, uh, uh, an explorer in his own right, uh, not of continents and nations, uh, but of bodies and body parts. Columbo was born in 1515, died in 1559. He was a professor of anatomy and surgery at the University of Padua, the same university uh, where he worked alongside Vesalius. In fact, he was one of Vesalius's students or colleagues. It's hard to tell from the manuscripts. But he, Vesalius in the Fabrica actually gives Columbo credit for being a tremendous help to him in in his dissective research. Uh, but he came to quarrel Columbo with Vesalius. This, one of the great uh, leaps forward in Vesalian anatomy is Vesalius reminded us the, of the limitations of Galen, that Vesalius criticized Galen all those uh, hundreds of years ago for not having dissected human bodies, for not having based his anatomy on the dissection of human beings. It was a very, very just complaint. And Vesalius saw things in human bodies that could not have been seen by Galen. And so in that sense, Vesalius represents a huge leap forward. But Columbo was unhappy with Vesalius because Columbo believed, rightly so, that too much of Vesalius's method was still dependent on Galenic models. Yes, Vesalius dissected bodies himself, but whenever Vesalius could not determine whether something Galen said was right or not. There was a tendency in Vesalius to give Galen the benefit of the doubt. Columbo said absolutely not. He was not going to do that. Uh, and interesting, whereas Vesalius's engagement was with Galen, right? That was the ancient he uh, dealt with the most. Columbo was actually wanted to go back to the research of Herophilus and Erasistratus. You may remember Herophilus and Erasistratus were the two Greek doctors in the Ptolemaic period, 2-300 BC. Uh, they were the ones who actually did dissect human bodies in the ancient world. And you remember, both Her Herophilus and Erasistratus, they were accused in later days of having vivisected human beings. 
And whether or not they did, we have no evidence. But we do know from reading what's left and what we have uh, of the school of Erasistratus and Herophilus, we know that both of those ancient Greeks argued that vivisection was a much better way to understand the workings of the human body than dissection. In other words, for Herophilus and Erasistratus, dissecting living creatures, including men, theoretically, would give us a much better understanding of how the body worked and how physiology worked, how the living body went about its business, than certainly the dissection of dead bodies, dead animal and dead human bodies. So whether or not the two men vivisected, they argued that vivisection was a superior way. And in that, we return to Columbo. That was Columbo's argument as well. Columbo argued that rather than falling back on Galen and the dissection of dead animals, that maybe we should go further back to Herophilus and Erasistratus, and maybe we should base our modern investigations on vivisection. We do not know, there's no evidence that Columbo vivisected human beings. However, in the opening of his great textbook, in one of the opening chapters, he argues very definitively that had it not been for Christian sentiment and basic human decency, uh, he argues very definitively that it would be better if we could. If we could uh, vivisect human beings, he argues, and he understands, he makes the argument that Christian sympathy, for instance, prohibits us from doing so, but boy does he lament the fact that we can't. Um, and so if we move, this is his great textbook. This is the title page of uh, the Dere Anatomica, all right, on anatomical things, or on anatomizing. This appeared in 1559, right? 1543 is the, is the Fabrica. 16 years later, you get the fantastic anatomical treatise of his student and successor, uh, Rialdo Colombo. Uh, he ultimately ended up in Rome, Colombo did, and that's where he did the research for his textbook. Well, interestingly, at the time, uh, the great uh, Renaissance artist Michelangelo was also living in Rome. In fact, we know uh, that Michelangelo's doctor at this time in Rome was no other than Rialdo Colombo. We have in Michelangelo's letters uh, testimony that Michelangelo suffered terribly from kidney stones and other painful maladies. And Columbo was his medical man, his doctor. We have all sorts of uh, belabored laments from Michelangelo about how painful and intrusive Columbo's uh, treatment for kidney stones was. So it's really remarkable that the, the a rapidly aging body of Michelangelo, uh, who was an old man by the time 1559 rolled around, the aging body of Michelangelo was under the care of this physician Columbo in Rome. And the two of them had planned on working together on an anatomical textbook. It would be the De Re Anatomica. And not, not some student of Titian now. It would be no greater an art, no less an artist than Michelangelo who would have done the illustrations for this textbook. Jan Stefan van Kalkar was a, le a, le a great artist, but he was a secondary artist working in the studio of the great Titian. Here, and, and as far as we know, van Kalkar had no dissecting experience himself. Now we have a proposed partnership between uh, a great and, and very, very a uh, famous dissector of human bodies, Rialdo Colombo, who was working at the college in Rome. And we have the partnership of him with the greatest artist of the age and a man who dissected as much as any uh, doctor did in the period, Michelangelo, who based all of his sculptor, all of his, his philosophy of painting and sculpting on actual dissections of human bodies. And so the two men were going to team up. The problem is, is that none of that happened. The only image we have from the De Re Anatomica is this one, is the title page. Uh, and as it, it, it makes a wonderful statement we're going to look at here in detail. But Columbo died prematurely. We're not sure what happened to him. Remember that dissecting was a very, very dangerous process, even into the 19th century, well into the 1800s, the early 1800s. Charles Darwin's uncle, for instance, another Charles Darwin, was an anatomist. And uh, in dissecting a human body, he, he stuck his hand into the, to the, the body cavity to reach for an organ, cut his thumb on a, a piece of sharp bone, that body was corrupted. It was infected um, uh, by, in all sorts of, we, we don't know how uh, at this remove, but that was a great danger. The organs of, of dead bodies oftentimes were hepatic. They had diseases. The blood, the blood that remained in the human body in a dissection quickly became corrupted. And so they didn't have gloves. Uh, they were using very sharp instruments inside of bodies. And so 
pieces of flesh and bone would peel off. And what happened to Darwin's uncle, and this happened quite often to anatomists, is he cut his finger uh, on a piece of sharp bone, perhaps on a dissecting knife. And that open wound came into contact with in the infected flesh, uh, the corrupted flesh of the cadaver, and, and killed him. And so we had also, we have all sorts of evidence of this happening before we began to understood the danger. I'll give you one other really sobering anecdote. In the 19th century, the late, 1800, the late 1700s through the middle of the 1800s, uh, many, many women were dying in childbirth from what was known as purpural fever, also known as childbed fever. And nobody knew what happened. All of a sudden, uh, young women, healthy women in, in the final stages of the pregnancy, they were, their blood was becoming horribly infected and corrupted. And it was killing them and their children. And we, they didn't know why. It took 40, 50 years. Uh, a, a, a researcher by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis came up with the understanding of what had happened. Oftentimes, young doctors who were dissecting cadavers in the morning uh, as part of their treatment, would leave the anatomy theater and they would go and uh, examine pregnant women in the final stages of their pregnancy. And in the course of examining the women, uh, routine examinations to see if the pregnancy was coming along, they would infect those women uh, with, the, with their dirty hands, the hands that they had not thoroughly cleaned after the dissections. And so they were transport, unknowingly, these young doctors were transporting that corrupted uh, tissue on their fingers and under their fingernails and delivering it into the bodies of pregnant women in, in terms of examining them. And that was causing this horrible, horrible disease. Again, it was a, a researcher by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis who finally recognized the correlation between uh, the decomposing flesh that still main, remained, even after they washed their hands under the subcutane, under the nails, for instance, uh, the correspondence between that and these examinations on these young women. So you, you, you see what a fraught and absolutely dangerous uh, thing dissecting bodies was in an age before refrigeration, in an age that didn't understand the transmission of diseases. Uh, and, and so the story of dissection is culturally fascinating and frustrating on so many levels as well, too. We go back to here the De Re Anatomica. Uh, we do know that, that, that before he could finish the book, uh, Columbo himself succumbed to a disease, possibly something he uh, accrued while dissecting bodies. It was his two sons who put the book out in 1559, and obviously his death uh, it, uh, obviated the ability of he to work with Michelangelo. And, but yet, nevertheless, the title page here, which is a wonderful, wonderful image, it gives us an idea of what the illustrations would have looked like. At the center, the, unlike the Fabrica, with all those dozens and dozens of people crowded into a very public facility, right? Here you have what is clearly a private dissection. So you had two kinds of dissections. You had public dissections, which were designed for the colleges, which were designed to uh, allow people from a broad spectrum of society, students, civic-minded people, priests, politicians, to come and watch, to see the revolutionary procedures. But you also had, and much more important, you had private dissections. Dissections where doctors and researchers would get together with very small groups of students to dissect bodies in more intensive, more comprehensive, and more academic ways. Uh, you, you remember the picture of Vesalius, where very little could be done in a room that big with that many people, you know, crowding in upon it here in these smaller private dissections. Uh, much more could be done much more leisurely. This is clearly a private dissection. A small band of, of, of like-minded men surround the, the corpse. Uh, there's your doctor at the center, Rialdo Colombo. As with the previous pictures, uh, the abdomen is open. We had mentioned to you. Why? Why were abdomens open first? Well, that that's where the most water, the most liquid was. That's where the most bacteria was. That's where the human waste, waste was processed. So whatever human waste were in the intestines when you died would corrupt quickly as well. So it was always the, the beginning. You always began by dissecting the abdomen. And he's opened the abdomen. They've begun to remove uh, the viscera, the most corruptible of the internal organs. And the anatomy is beginning apace. And it's really remarkable when you look at this scene. Obviously, you're in a church setting of some sort. In fact, if you look over the shoulder on the right-hand side, you will see two, one on the left, one on the right, two sculptural niches, uh, carvings, indentations into the wall where they put statues. On the right-hand side, you can see, on the right-hand side, you can see behind the head of the man on the far right, a woman with her arm over her head, a sculpture placed in that niche. Uh, if this is indeed a church, 
And obviously the woman in the sculpture, appear, a sculpture appears to be naked, the statue. That very well may be Eve, the statue of Eve, the naked mother of God. Uh, in fact, we have many uh, Im images of Eve from the period naked with her arm in exactly that position over her head. If you look to the far left, you will see another niche, but this one's empty, right? That would make sense if indeed that niche had been filled with Adam, the, fi the nude male figure of Adam. He seems to not be there. And so what's happening in this church? So we have a private dissection, not a public one. It's clearly a church setting. We've got that empty niche. Notice at the bottom on the left, a man kneel, uh, sitting down on the floor, just like in Vesalius' picture, the picture of Vesalius. You have a man there who is sketching the image. He is drawing a picture. He's an artist. So it's this union again of art and anatomy. And there he sits as he sketches what's going on in the procedure. But right above him is a man with a book. And so the man with the book, probably Vesalius in this instance, right? Uh, so maybe what's happening here is it, this is a teaching lecture for a small group of medical students. And what's taking place is it's being captured by artists so that the illustrations could be moved forward. But you also have a comparison, uh, an immediate comparison going on between what Vesalius may have seen in the body or Galen and now what Columbo sees. Right? And so the other interesting thing that strikes us superficially is in the bottom right-hand side, uh, between the little figure of the uh, little angel, a puto they're called, we'll get to that in a moment, between his figure and the figure of the tall bearded man, you have a ch what looks like a chalice, an urn of some sort, but it's highly elaborate, right? It's kind of a cross between a urn, a, fu a funerary urn, maybe where you'd put ashes, and a chalice, uh, the kind of thing that would be used on an altar to, for instance, uh, uh, replicate the body and blood of Christ. It's a very highly elaborate image. Now remember, this is in a church too. So what's happening here is that spiritual and anatomical coming together again. These highly sophisticated researches are taking place in a sanctified church. In other words, that what you see happening here may be taking place directly on the altar. The altar in a Catholic church where body and blood where bread and wine became body and blood, right? Through the metaphysical process of saying the mass. On the altar, the priest who presides over the mass turns simple bread and simple wine into the body and blood of Christ for Roman Catholics. That was literally true. And yet on that same altar here now, we have this dissective procedure, right? And an urn that looks very suspiciously like a chalice. What's going on here? Let's jump to our second view of this image. We looked at the periphery. Now let's look at the major players. You've got anatomist, corpse, puto, and artist. Now a puto, right, they are putai, they were these little angels represented uh, as, as servants of art or as actual angels. Uh, in medieval literature, medieval art, oftentimes the little puto, the little angel figure, bottom center, was a representative of the human soul. So whenever artists wanted to depict the human soul leaving the body in medieval painting, they would often d uh, describe or draw the soul or paint it like a little puto. And so you have something really remarkable happening here. If indeed that little angel figure is a puto, is possibly a representation of the soul, what's happening in the image? It really is kind of stark. The one figure we haven't talked about yet is the figure whose hand the, the puto is taking. Notice that he's reaching up and taking the hand of a very striking man. In fact, the only figure in the entire image that occupies the top half of the picture and the bottom half of the picture is that tall man on the right in the long fur coat. That is Michelangelo Buonarroti. That is the great Michelangelo. And so what's happening here? If that soul, if that picture, that little puto is the soul, maybe, it's the soul of the man on the altar whose body's being dissected. Is it possible that maybe what Columbo's telling us is that that niche on the back left is empty because this is the body of Adam, Adam of Adam and Eve that has been opened. And maybe this is Columbo's testament to vivisection. Maybe the body was opened why the bot why it was still alive. That would make sense. If, the, if Adam was placed on the altar 
and opened while still alive, and all the medical men have watched, right, that absolutely transgressive spectacle of a living human body die in the prosecution of scientific knowledge, it would make sense that the soul of Adam would be right there. Maybe it's the soul who's taking by the hand Michelangelo. And what you see is a tense exchange. The artist, the seated artist on the left, obviously is a, is a student. He is not a master. This is Columbo's jab at Stefan van Kalkar, isn't it? All right? Not only did Vesalius create an inferior textbook, according to Columbo, but he used an inferior artist to illustrate it. What is the soul of the recently deceased person on the altar? What is it doing? It is taking Michelangelo by the hand and, at, and supplanting that seated artist with the genius of Michelangelo himself. Look at the way Michelangelo, with his right hand, points to himself. Oh, me? You're summoning me, right? And so not only is the text and the research of Columbo going to supersede that of Vesalius, so says the image, so too the art, the drawing of Michelangelo, will supersede the drawing of the artist seated on the left, right? And it is absolutely fascinating that the only figure that straddles both the top and the bottom of the image, and go back to that and see, is the artist. See, the artist has part of his life, if the bottom part of the image is dev devoted to art, with the seated artist, with the soul, which is genius, kind of memory, the power of art to make us remember. And you've got Michelangelo, too, occupying that bottom rung of the painting. And that's devoted to the artistic achievement. Then the top half from the, the altar up, those are all medical men. Maybe what you have happening here, because Michelangelo is the only figure who has a presence in the bottom. And the, remember, he was a, both an anatomist, Michelangelo, and he was an artist. He's the only one fit to occupy both levels of this painting. And so what's happening here? If this is what we think it might be, maybe this is Columbo saying to his audience, we ought to be able to vivisect human beings. He wanted to, he said so in his text, right? Even though he tipped his hat to why he couldn't, like his ancient guides, Herophilus and Erasistratus, he insisted that the only way to really generate knowledge moving forward would be vivisectively. Maybe this is a symbolic uh, representation of human vivisection. If we go back to the image and look at that, maybe it is Adam, and maybe Adam was opened and allowed to die. And you think about the sin of Adam and Eve, right? You think about the sin of Adam and the redemptive nature of what Christ would do later. It would kind of make sense that Columbo is couching this potentially dangerous argument, the potentially dangerous heretical argument that it's okay to, die, to vivisect human beings. Maybe he's trying to get around the danger of all of that by making the whole thing a symbolic dissection of Adam, vivisection of Adam. The soul that's recently been freed from the body is begging Michelangelo to illustrate correctly what lesser artists couldn't do. The fact that it's in a church, the fact that it's, in an, it's on an altar in a church, the fact that you have this significance between the Roman Catholic Mass, where base things like bread and wine are transformed into the living body and blood of Christ. Maybe that's what's happening here. And maybe that urn between the soul and the artist, maybe that is a chalice. Maybe that urn, which would be used among other things, to hold the blood, the excess blood, that was found in the body that had to be drained off to be able to access and dissect it. Maybe that the blood of that cadaver that went into that urn, maybe there is a huge metaphysical statement being made here by Columbo. A statement that, that not only is vivisection not necessarily evil, but that in the, understood in its proper contexts, understood as the unlocking of the mysteries of the human body made in the image of God, maybe the anatomist argues Maybe you could make an, a sacramental argument for it. Uh, really remarkable when you think about what's happening in the image here. Uh, and uh, we look at the, if go to the third image there for us. Is this a spectacle of human vivisection? I mean, again, uh, his guides were Erasistratus and Herophilus, who absolutely insisted that vivisection was the only way to go. He wanted Columbo to draw a distinction between his new method and the method of Vesalius, which was based on Galen, which was based on dissecting dead things, not examining living things. 
Is this a link between the Roman Catholic Eucharist and the, su the subject of human vivisection? And the other thing we'll say about Columbo is some of the things he was able to discover in human bodies were quite remarkable, and they were dependent on vivisecting animals, if not human beings. Uh, Columbo is one of the first Western medical men to suggest the pulmonary circulation of the blood. In order to understand, and it's amazing that still in the middle of the 16th century, we didn't understand uh, that blood, the, the heart was a pump that pushed blood through veins and arteries, right? All throughout the body in a circular motion. We didn't understand that. And it's the kind of thing you can't tell by looking at dead animals. There's no, even dead human beings, you, by looking at the heart and the arterial and the, venal, the venous system, we, there's no way you can necessarily tell what the function is. That's something that had to be found out by watching living hearts in open chest cavities of animals like pigs or dogs or goats. Uh, and of course, as er Herophilus and Erasistratus argued, and so too did Columbo, uh, if you're going to study human uh, function, physiology, you'd need human bodies, right? So it really is a remarkable thing. And it was certainly true that the vivisecting of animals was what convinced Columbo that indeed uh, the pulmonary circulation of the blood occurred, that in the heart region, right, the, the heart did pump blood uh, uh, in a certain way throughout the body. It would be the English physician, Sir William Harvey in 1618, right? Another 59 years it would take before Harvey, an English doctor, proved once and for all and demonstrated categorically in his experiments that the heart did circulate blood throughout the body. And William Harvey himself based his anatomical knowledge on Aristotle and the ancient doctors, not on Galen. Right? In other words, that Harvey's method for discovering once and for all the pulmonary circulation of the blood, Harvey's method was vivisective not dissective, although we have, again, absolutely no evidence that Harvey vivisected human beings any more than we do Columbo. But Harvey understood, as Columbo did as well, that that was the only research that would lead to such discoveries. So it's fascinating history moving forward. One last correspondence uh, that makes kind of interesting sense if you take a look at the next image. Uh, this is Michelangelo's picture of the Last Judgment. It's on the Sistine Chapel, the West Wall. And so here you see uh, all the souls on the last day getting up from their graves and being reunited with their bodies, as St. Paul promised us. And that happens to be the muscular naked figure with the knife in his hand. That's St. Bartholomew from Michelangelo's Last Supper, uh, excuse me, Last Judgment. And notice he carries in his right hand a knife, and he carries what looks to be a flayed skin in his left hand. Well, St. Bartholomew, one of the apostles, was, modeled, was, was martyred by being flayed to death. He was captured and persecuted for his faith, and his tormentors stripped the skin off him, peeled the skin off him while he was alive. They flayed him. And so there is St. Bartholomew, who is being reunited with his physical body. And so he has in his left hand the very skin that was flayed off of him, and the very knife in his right hand that flayed him. And what's absolutely fascinating is the face of the flayed skin is a self-portrait of Michelangelo, the artist. So one of the few self-portraits Michelangelo drew of himself is on the actual face of the flayed skin of St. Bartholomew. Now, if you take a close look at the face of St. Bartholomew, take a close look at the knife in St. Bartholomew's hand, and let us go back one slide to the picture of Columbo. We know that Columbo was the physician to Michelangelo. We don't know when. The earliest we can put them together is after the Sistine Chapel had been painted, but it's possible that the two men knew each other. You look at the flowing beard on Columbo. You look at the knife in his right hand and the shape of the knife. Look at those things and now go back to Bartholomew. Is it possible? Is it a bit of an inside joke? Remember, uh, Rialdo Columbo was treating Michelangelo for things like the stones, kidney stones, which means he had to cut into the body to try to provide some relief. Is it possible that in the Sistine Chapel, St. Bartholomew is modeled after the anatomist Rialdo Columbo, Michelangelo's doctor? And Michelangelo, we know, his face is, face is on the flayed skin. Is this a wry commentary of the relationship between the two men? It's a fascinating speculation, one that can't be proven, one that I've never heard actually made anywhere else. But it does make a certain kind of sense. So you see again, and what's the, what's the uh, moral of this story? 
that you, the rise of anatomy was absolutely dependent on great artists to be able to represent and reproduce in books the images. This, this absolutely beautiful union between physician and artist, why many of the great Renaissance artists took up dissection themselves. Michelangelo dissected for so long he almost ruined his health. Uh, I mean, the, the, you think about it, um, bringing, this was not done, Michelangelo's dissections were not done, his private dissections were not done with groups of people. Michelangelo would negotiate for corpses. There's a great story uh, where Michelangelo, a beautiful young Moorish boy, had died, and one of the doctors had the corpse, and Michelangelo begged it off him for an anatomy. So the doctor put the young corpse, the, put the corpse of the young man in a carriage, had it driven to Michelangelo. He took it up to his private rooms and dissected it over a period of weeks. Uh, but Michelangelo, with all of his commitments, didn't always get to the body quickly. And so some of the neighbors got to complaining about the, let's just say, the aroma of the detritus. And so unlike the doctors who had to dissect the bodies quickly and then have them buried, and all, even executed felons, by the way, whose bodies were turned over to the doctors, had to be given Christian burial, what was left of them, after they were anatomized. But Michelangelo couldn't always get quickly to the bodies. This, this is what propelled the art and the science forward. Again, how science and the humanistic disciplines really were absolutely critical working together. How much better off white might we be culturally today uh, if science recognized uh, the possibility of philosophical, moral, uh, and not ethical. Science deals with ethics. It doesn't deal with morality, which is a different animal. How much better off might we be if there was closer conjunction between the arts and the sciences and not this radical divorcing of them that we see today? Uh, so it really is an interesting speculation. And then as, as the Catholic world, as the Protestant Reformation uh, worked its way through Europe, uh, northern countries from England to the Netherlands uh, to, the, to Germany uh, chose a Protestant path as opposed to a Roman Catholic one. We have the rise of Protestant, anat Protestant anatomy, anatomy and physicians and research approaching uh, the subject of human dissection from a more Protestant, less Catholic perspective that as we may have seen in Colombo's Italian church dissection. Take a look at this image of the Leiden in the Netherlands, the Leiden Anatomy Theater uh, by night. Here is another public dissection, this time in a Protestant nation. And notice that you have the same circular anatomical theater. You have the same pageantry. You have the same imagery. This is clearly this is from 1610. It's clearly a public dissection. Uh, you have that same emphasis on book, physician, and womb. Now you think too about in Protestant theology and the Protestant revolution, think about how the Bible, the actual book, again became the center. In Roman Catholic culture, right, the Bible itself was important, but it sort of had a secondary importance to the liturgy, to the mass, to the Eucharist. One of the great gripes uh, of Protestant theology was the book had been decentered, right? And so here you have the book brought back with a vengeance. There is the physician at the center of the table, and he's got his hand gesturing to his right to the book, right, the book. The book became the authority once again. The book became the absolute authority, whether it's the book in terms of the Bible that became the absolute authority for, for our theological belief, or whether the book of the body, the new books of the body being written, that became the absolute authority on what we dissected and how again, you see the, the circle comes full circle around again. And two, you have a female cadaver on the table, same images, uh, the womb exposed, and the doctor lecture. Now, unlike Vesalius, who had his fingers in the womb to suggest uh, a different understanding, this doctor has the exposed womb and he has his book, right? Mediating between the two things. Uh, so we'll stop there for this lesson. We'll pick this up again in Leiden. When we begin lesson number four, lecture number four, we begin again in Lyon, uh, uh, Leiden and we carry ourselves all the way through 1832. 1832, in our final lecture, is the year they passed laws changing the way doctors accessed bodies. And that ushered out this era of anatomy. And so we'll see you for episode four, and we'll wind down with some really fascinating and I think important discussion about where dissection was headed. <laughs>